Okay, amazing. As people come, we'll just start. So hi everyone, I'm Mary Emanuel. I'm one of the co-founders of the NHS Python community and I'll be hosting today's show and tell. Before we begin, I encourage everyone to check that they are muted so we don't have any untoward background noise. Also, it's completely your choice if you want your camera on or not, but this talk will be recorded and shared publicly on YouTube for future viewing. So for those who don't know, the NHS Python community is a large community of practice which champions the use of Python and open code in the NHS and healthcare sector. Our latest show and tell is all about software engineering best practices for data scientists, led by the brilliant Nick Fortescue. Nick is a software engineer who has worked at Google Health for almost 12 years, originally at Android, but now works in population health. Before Google, he worked a variety of places like research labs, startup, and in finance. He has degrees in maths and computing from Oxford and has a degree in psychology from the Open University. He now lives in Oxford with his wife, Becky, who is a population health researcher at an NHS trust and is also a doctor. And he has two sons. So over the last year, we've been really, really lucky. Nick has volunteered 20 percent of his week to support the NHS Python community in an open source collaborative geospatial project with Google Health. And Nick has learned some things along the way, and he wants to share this best practice to the wider NHS community and the wider healthcare coding community to save us all time and stress. Please, if you have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A function for Nick to answer. There are going to be some interactive elements, so please put that in the chat as well. And we'll get that. We'll get to that in the end. Um, so now I will unshare my screen and hand over to Nick. Hi, Mary. Hi, everyone. Just give me a minute while I share my screen. Um, and hopefully you can all see that. Um, so, yeah, it's a real privilege to be here. Thank you so much for taking your time out of your busy days to watch this. Um, if you see me looking up like this, um, it's because I've got another monitor above the laptop screen. So uh, I'm not looking over your heads or rolling my eyes. I'm having a look at my notes. Um, and I really appreciate you taking your time out of your busy days to watch the recording. I hope it's useful for all of you. Um, just to let you know, like Mary said, I'll be asking some interactive questions during the talk. So I might ask for a show of hands. Um, be free or free to use the raise hand function in Teams or um, put the answer in the chat. Um, and so try and have that available to you. I know. If you're anything like me, the temptation is to have a talk on and then be doing some other work in the background. Um, but be ready to jump back in, into the chat later on. Um, and Mary, thanks a lot for inviting me and for all the great work you do organising this community. I've really appreciated being part of PyCom and the Analyst X community um, and learning sort of what's going on um, with the NHS data scientists. Um, before I start, I should note that I'm not speaking here as a representative of Google. I'm speaking as a private individual. Um, these views expressed are my own. Um, hopefully they're useful. Um, so here's what I'm intending to cover today. Um, I'll talk a bit about me and the aim of the talk, and I'll then cover four areas from software engineering that I think might be useful for data scientists. So those are source code control, um, readability and refactoring, testing and continuous integration, and knowing your tools. Uh, if you don't know what any of these things mean, don't worry, I'll explain when we get to them. Um, then at the end, we'll have some time for Q&A where you can ask me about the talk or ask me about anything else. I don't promise to answer, but you can ask me about anything else. Um, and as Mary said, you can add questions in the chat as we go along. Um, and Mary will feed them to me at the end, or you can ask them in person at the end. You know, just turn your camera on or unmute. Um, Mary will coordinate that. So first, why are we all here? Um, so, so you understand where I'm coming from. Thanks for the intro, Mary, but I'll just tell you a little bit about me. Um, I've been a software engineer at Google for 11 years. Uh, it'll be 12 years in August. And before I joined Google, I'd done a lot of things. My first job was at a research lab. I then moved to a startup during the dot-com boom, and then we had the dot-com crash. Um, I then to move to working as a trader in finance in banks and hedge funds, um, and then we had the financial crash. 
Um, and then I moved to Google, which is probably really leaving you really terrified about what's going to happen next with tech companies, given my past history. But uh, I moved to Google because I probably like many of you, actually, I really wanted to make a positive difference to the world. And I thought at Google, I could potentially help billions of people. So I worked on Android and Google Play, which, you know, for helping mobile phones um, for billions of people all over the world for many years. But a few years ago, I got the opportunity to move on to Google efforts in health. And I'm currently on a team trying to do things to help people working in population health. So if you work in population health and you think there's any areas where collaboration will be Google, will be good, do get in touch. Um, my contact details will be up on a slide at the end. Um, like Mary said, I'm also married to a doctor. My wife, Becky, is a qualified GP. She's also a population health researcher at St. George's in London, and she works with the Cochrane Collaboration. Um, we've got two boys, A's one and three, and my brother is a civil servant data scientist, though not working in health. So um, that gives me a bit of family motivation to improving healthcare worldwide, but especially in the UK. So, um, the key message I want to give to this talk is there is a better way. Um, so through my career, there's lots of times I've started thinking, hey, I'm pretty good at this software stuff. And then I've had this eye opening moment where someone shows me there's an even better way to work. Um, sometimes I just do it that way. I just take it from me and I take it. But sometimes the act of being shown you can do things differently can take you to a new level, even if you don't th do things the same way. So this photo is uh, Dick Fosbury, um, inventor of the Fosbury flop. Um, credit to BBC Sport for the photo. Um, so he revolutionized high jumping by showing that there's, there's this weird way of jumping over the high jump bar and it could get you to go even higher. He won gold at the 1968 Olympics, oh, typo. And um, things can go even, and, and yeah, high jump's never been the same since. And so I'm not claiming to be Dick Fosbury. Everything I'm gonna show you was invented by someone else. And I can't teach you all about these techniques but hopefully in at least one area, I'll show you there might be a better way. And then through that explore, you know, just knowing there's a possibility of a better way, it might lead your own individual explorations to make you better yourself and give you some hints for finding those better ways. So roughly this is my life in computer programming. Um, I wrote my first program age five. I was very lucky to have some parents with uh, a lot of foresight. Um, uh, back when I was five, there wasn't the internet, so I wasn't copying and pasting from Stack Overflow or getting an AI large language model to write some code for me. Um, I was copying, typing in basic from books and then from magazines, and I was modifying them to make little pictures of rocket ships or to insults to my little brother or something like that. And the uh, programs got more complicated over time. But essentially, I was still trying to run it, and then I would shout, hooray, when it worked, or seemed to work, and I was the only user. And then at uni, uni, I went on to study maths and computer science, and this was stuff like data structures, algorithms. I'd be proving my program correct and looking at speed and efficiency. I did a little bit of competitive programming, but to be honest, it didn't matter to anyone but me whether my code worked or not. It just yeah, had to run and that was me. Um, and then I started my first job and it was this whole new world. Other people had to read my code. Other people had to modify and maintain my code. Um, other people had to run or use my code to get their jobs done. Um, and so it's this final area um, of sort of this professional engineering that this talk is gonna be about. I'm not gonna talk about algorithms or stuff you'd learn in the computer science degree. I'm not gonna tell you how to program in R or Python or C++ or Java. There's loads of courses of that on the internet. Instead, I'm gonna try and talk about some real world techniques that I think help reduce my stress, increase the reliability of my code and help me deliver a bit faster and hopefully it'll help you. And hopefully it'll open your eyes like a lot of people have opened mind over the years, but it won't take you quite so many years to get there. Um, quick aside on language. I'll probably say code a lot. I'll probably say software a lot and coding. And some of you might think I'm data scientist. I'm not a software engineer. I don't code or I don't write software. Um, I'm pretty inclusive by what I mean by this. Um, I think an Excel spreadsheet is software written in a functional programming language. 
Um, I think a Colab or a Jupyter Notebook or a one-off Python script is just as much software as anything I write at Google. So hopefully everything I say applies to a lot of what you do each day. Um, phew. That was a very long introduction. So we're going to have our first interactive bit. Let's check if anyone is still listening and if you guys are really here. Um, so put your hands up or say yes in the chat if you've ever heard something like one of these sentences. I'm sure this used to work, or I thought I fixed that, or let's just try changing that plus to a minus, or who wrote this? What on earth were they thinking? Or this, this is a bit risky because of the demo gods, or sorry, we're not ready. I tried it this morning and it wasn't working. Um, well, I can see there's quite a lot of yeses and hands up coming through in the chats. Um, thank you for those responses. You can clear the hands now. Um, hopefully this talk will help you um, say these a bit less often and maybe help um, some of the others you work with say them a bit less often too. Um, so let me go to the next slide. So four simple areas to make your life better. We're going to look at version control. We're going to look at readability and refactoring. We're going to look at testing continuous integration and knowing your tools and libraries. Don't worry if you don't know what any of these are. I'll explain them as we go along. So, so first, let's talk about source code version control. Um, by which I mean Git or Mercurial or Perforce, or you might have used CVS, or if you're old like me, Microsoft Source Safe, or um, any of these systems are source code version control. Um, so let's go back, blast from the past. We're going to do a bit of time travel. We're going to go back to August 2000. It was the middle of the dot com bubble. And Joel Spolsky was this software engineer who'd worked on the Microsoft ex and he'd on the Excel team. And you don't, you might not know it, but he's probably affected your life. Um, he was one of the co founders of Stack Overflow. So if you ever use Stack Overflow or any of the Stack Exchange sites, you've probably seen him. Um, he also helped found Trello. So if you've ever used Trello for task management, you've probably come across that as well. And anyway, back in 2000, he wrote this blog article called The Joel Test, which really influenced me. It was 12 yes or no questions for measuring how good a software team was. And his very first question, almost 25 years ago, was does the team use version control? Um, this was his primary difference between mediocre software teams and good software teams. Um, so you might have never used version control, in which case you might be thinking, I should go and learn about that. And you should go and learn about that. But if you have, if you, you might think, oh, yeah, I do use version control. We're fine. My team, we use Git or whatever. Um, this brings me on to the concept of code smells. Um, you might not know this term. Um, I use it a lot, but it's not necessarily that well known. What do I mean by a smell? So a smell is a sign something might be wrong. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean something is bad. It's a bit like a smelly food. So that cheese or that fermented fish might supposed to be smelly and it might be really tasty. But often a smell means you might want to beware the food or at least check it out twice as something might not quite be right in the kitchen. And code smells are, or practice smells are the same. They're sort of a sign something might not quite be right. So when I see them, I don't know something is wrong, but I suspect something is wrong and I need to look closer. So let me show you what I mean. Here's a couple of smells of lack of good source version control understanding. Here's some real smells I found in our project. So have a look at them. The left hand side is a list of files in the repository. And the right hand side is a little snippet from a Python script. They're both from a project that's been using Git from version control for a long time. Um, and they're both smells that you probably don't trust your version control system the way you should. So first, the left hand side, look at the extensions. We've got test five, test six, test six A, test seven, test eight. You might have underscore date or underscore old or underscore new, or you might have lots of directories or folders with copies of your code from different point. And you've got to ask, why are you keeping eight versions around? In your source code control version, it's easy to go back and look at old versions and new versions. You shouldn't need to keep them sitting around in your directories. And it's a bit of a smell that the version control system isn't trusted. 
Similarly, look at the right hand side. Now at the very top, the light gray lines are sort of commented outlines. Um, it's another sign that you don't quite trust version control system. The code is still in the file. If you trusted the version control system, you probably wouldn't need it there. You could just go back and look at the previous version if you needed this code again. So why is it commented out? So you might say, well, what's the problem with commented out? Um, that's a good question. So the big problem is it slows you right down. It really slows you down. So suppose you did a search for all uses of one particular method or one particular function in your project. Um, if you've got eight copies of your file, you're going to get eight hits in your search when there's only actual one usage. And whenever you change the function, you have to go and change it in every strip, which means you need eight times as much work for every change you do which probably means in reality, you don't change the function because you can't be bothered to go and change it in eight scripts or you leave seven scripts unchanged and then they don't work anymore. Um, or even worse, you copy it and give it a different name and the problem gets even worse because suddenly you've got even more code. Um, commented out code is similar. So searches for code will find something you think is code, but it actually isn't being used. But it's even worse. Eventually, when you uncomment it, it won't work anymore because the compiler or your language hasn't been checking it. And your automatic refactoring tools won't know how to fix it either. Um, I'll talk a, bit, talk a bit more about automatic refactoring tools either. So the solution is, I would encourage all of you know your, all your version control systems. And most people have two levels of version control systems. So first, you've got some sort of editor. Um, you might use the IntelliJ family, like PyCharm or something like that. You might use VS Code. You might even just use Excel or Google Sheets. Um, they've got version histories. IntelliJ's got local history. VS Code has something called Timeline. They all let you go back in time. Go about, have a play with it. Find those menu items. Um, find the things that let you know how to use them and make sure you think, yeah, I can go back and look at past versions of the code. Um, the second level version control I'm talking about is your Git. Um, so Git's winning in this market, but Mercurial is good, um, Perforce is good, um, even CVS is good. Um, but you should know it and learn how to use it and get confident in using it. Don't use it just because you have to. Um, you should know how to commit easily. You know how, should know how to look at a point in time. You should know how to roll back to a point in time. You don't need to know every... Ah, good question from the chat. What is a version control system? If you've heard of Git, Git is a version control system. It's something which says, if you've ever used something like docs and you use track changes in docs, it's like that. It's something which lets you go back to previous versions of a file or file and roll forward or backwards and see the changes, see who made the changes. Um, there's tons of instructions on the internet about it. If you search for instruction to Git, introduction to Mercurial or introduction to version control, you'll find it. Um, if you are not using it, like I said in an earlier slide, it's probably one of the single biggest differences between amateur software engineers and professionals. Um, and I'd say almost if you're, you can't really be what I think of as a professional proper professional software engineer without using it. Um, and I think the probably the same is becoming true in data scientists. I understand from Mary and the team that use of Git's becoming much more common in the NHS, especially with things like the um, RAP stuff coming from the Goldacre view of reproducible analytical pipelines. This whole concept of reproducible is you need to get back to how things worked at any point in time. You've just got to know this stuff. Um, so take the time investment to do it. It will pay off leaps and bounds. You'll save it. So it's a bit of chat interaction again. Get ready to your keyboards or for the for, get to your the chat window in Teams. If you can't find it, click on the thing labeled chat. Um, and two questions. I want two words from you. The first word I want is what version control system do you use? If you use one, if you don't use one, type none. And the second thing is, do you feel confident using it? So you might do git comma yes or git comma no, go. Type it into the chat.
Great. So thank you for all those answers. It looks like I was right. Git does seem to be winning. Um, and I'm glad loads of you are confident, confident in using it. That's great news. I see some people need to grow in it. Um, for those of you who don't, you can see lots of your colleagues are more confident. There's probably people around there you can ask. There's loads of good introductions on the internet. Do search and do take the time out from your busy days to just spend, you know, half an hour, an hour, just in a safe environment playing with it so you feel more confident in doing it. You will save that time overall. Okay, my next tip is um, I'll move on to the next area, which is readability and refactoring. Um, so what do I mean by these? What I mean by readability and refactoring is writing your code so someone else can read it and that being your primary concern. So let's look at the smells again. The smells that maybe you aren't doing readability refactoring quite nice is suppose you look at some code and you instantly know which member of the team wrote it. Um, or maybe on your team, people are scared to edit other people's code. Or maybe you feel a little bit scared or ashamed to have your code reviewed by anyone else. Um, or maybe you find you're just spending a lot of time debugging code rather than writing it for the first time or rewriting old code from scratch rather than fixing it. Or maybe you come across this code and you think, what on earth is this doing? And this might not be someone else's code. This might be your code you wrote six months ago. Um, those are signs that readability probably isn't the priority. Um, and one of the big things I learned when I moved to professional software engineering is this focus on readability. Um, I've come across this anti-pattern, um, which is thinking that being complicated makes you impressive. Um, I've seen it loads of places. I've seen people being in awe of a programmer or a PhD or someone giving a talk and thinking, wow, that's so complicated. I don't understand a word they're saying, but that person must be a genius. And like, that is wrong. Real geniuses, and I've known a few people I put into that category, they can explain complicated things. You know, people who write code that other people can't read are not geniuses, they are bad programmers, full stop. Um, there's a quote from a guy called, um, I think it's Scott Hanselman. Um, he wrote, a junior engineer creates complex problems. Sorry, a junior engineer is someone who creates complex solutions to simple problems. An engineer creates simple solutions to simple problems. A senior engineer creates simple solutions to complex problems. And a Rockstar engineer, which I and Hanselman don't like the term, but they make complex problems disappear. So when you're writing code, don't think, oh, I'm great, this is complicated, which is what I thought when I was 15. Um, you, wanna, you wanna be making things look really, really simple. Um, one of the best ways of doing this is code reviews. I'm not going to talk much about code reviews in this talk, but um, that might be something to think about if you aren't doing it yet, using the GitHub functionality to let other people look at your code and go, do you understand this? Um, you'd never send a doc out without getting someone to proofread it first. Why do we send code out without getting someone to proofread it for us? The main purpose of it is not to run, it's to be read. Um, this book is also quite good by Robert Martin, it's called Clean Code, and it's all about writing really readable code. Um, so you might want to consider reading that um, if you want to follow up on this. Um, oh, <clears throat> I also want to say, there's this, I'm going to get onto this, but there's a golden rule of refactor constantly um, and use tools to help you. And I'll talk a bit about refactoring in a minute. Um, so let's do a bit another bit of interaction. Straw poll, just so I know the audience. Um, hands up on Teams um, with the raise hand button if you know what refactoring means. I'm not going to call on you to answer. I just want to get a feel for how many people have come across the term and know what it means. Um, so we've got a few. That's great. Um, but not everyone. So I will uh, go on and give a little explanation. Um, so refactoring is defined as improving the design of existing code. Um, there's the new cover of the book. Here's my trusty old cover of the book, which is normally sitting up here on my bookshelf because it's one of my go-to things. Um, it's basically not rewriting code from scratch. It's doing small incremental changes and the code needs to give exactly the same results at the end. 
Um, now you can see why managers and leaders might hate you doing this. After all, you're spending time coding and you're knowing in advance the code is going to do exactly what it did before. So isn't that the definition of wasted work you might get from people? Is, you know, isn't it just a waste of time? And the answer is no, it's not. The benefits are um, debugging becomes much, much faster the more readable the code is. Um, you do far fewer rewrites. Extra, every extra new feature you do gets quicker and you normally have fewer bugs. Basically, everything you do becomes much quicker as you go along. Um, the more people you have on the project and the more people who touch the code, the bigger benefit is. But I still, if I'm doing a toy experimental project that no one's going to see but me, I still refactor. Oh, thanks for that definition in the chat. Um, it's, uh, yeah. It's, if, did your mum or dad ever tell you to tidy up as you went along? And you probably didn't listen to them if you're anything like me. Um, it's tidying up as you go along for code. Uh, let me give an example for those who maybe haven't seen it. Um, my two favorite refactorings are rename and extract a method, extract method, extract variable. There's this huge list of other refactorings at refactoring.guru or in the uh, Martin Fowler book, um, but the refactoring.guru has them all for free on the web, so it's easy to find if you Google it. Um, let's have a look at a couple of them just so you know what I'm talking about. So name rename is the most basic one. Naming is really, really, really hard. Um, it usually means, you, because naming is really hard, you usually don't get it right first time, which means I have to give variables and methods multiple names before I get them right. And if I always kept the first one, my code would be terrible. Um, you might be scared of renaming. You might think it takes a lot of time that you might break things. But if you're using a modern editor, um, it takes that fears away. They are really good at renaming. They find all the relevant uses and they change all of them. They ignore the irrelevant ones. They can even fix usages in comments, in other files, et cetera. But even if you have to, you have to do old fashioned search and replace, it's still worth renaming all the time. Um, so at the bottom of the slide, you can see in VS, in all the editors, there's really quick shortcuts. And I would say, if you're a software engineer or a data scientist, you should have these burnt into your brain. My, you know, my fingers can do Shift F6 probably faster they can, than they can type a lot of words um, because I use it so much. Um, don't be, uh, you've, you've got to learn these things and you've got to use them if you want to be able to move quickly. Um, and then, so here's an example of renaming. You might say calc, stock with calc x, y, and you realize calc doesn't really explain what it's doing. I want it to be called calculate WGS84 distance, which for those of you who work in geospatial, you'll know what that means. Um, for those of you who don't, you'll have some idea that it's calculating a distance. And instead of calling it x and y, I'm calling it start and end. Now, if if I do this, if I get my tool to rename, renaming is a matter of seconds it will less than seconds and it, um, it just makes the code so much better. Um, so get used to doing these in your tool. Um, the other thing, that, here's another refactoring, is extract method. So here's some real Python code. Um, it's multiple lines and it's perfectly readable code. You know, you can see what it's doing if you've used pandas and um, you're used to Python, but you can extract it into, you can take all this group together and you can give it a name like retrieve and save epoca thing. And suddenly I can see the only thing this code produces is a single data frame. And all those other intermediate variables are not relevant anymore. So anyone reading the code doesn't have to keep lots of things in their mind. Now there is this classic psychology paper, which I love from 1956 in the Psychological Review um, by Miller. And he wrote this thing called the magical number seven plus or minus two. And the basically idea behind this paper was our brain can only really keep seven things plus or minus two in our short term memory. And after that, we have to kick some things out of our short term memory. Now, so when I'm reading this code on the uh, left hand side, I've got variables, URL, file handler, zip file, object, first file, file. My brain is filling up and suddenly those seven slots are going. and I don't know which of them to keep in my head and I can't keep them all in my head. So reading the code further down the page, I don't know what to do. 
when I've extracted it to a method, I know I only have to keep one thing in my head, the GP practice DF. And if I want to see how the method works, I can jump into the method, and then I only need to keep these variables in scope in my head. And so this refactoring is helping my brain have less load and less stress, which makes debugging quicker, reading easier, fewer bugs. Um, it's a big win. So in IntelliJ, I can just highlight some code and do control out M, and it will turn the code, it will work out what the return value should do, it will work out the correct parameters will do, and again, in seconds, I can pull the code out into a method. The editor will do it for me. Similarly, VS Code will do it. Um, I don't know if our studio will do it, um, but if it doesn't yet, it probably will in future, I guess. Um, you should learn these keystrokes. Um, even if you and even if you don't have to do it manually, it's still worth the effort. It's just a little bit slower. Um, so summary from the refactoring and readability thing, don't think you're writing code to run. You are, the lesson I've learned over the years is you are writing, writing code to be read. Um, so tidy up as you go along and learn to tidy up really quick and easily with the tools. Okay, almost through, halfway through. How am I doing for time? Oh, and halfway through the time as well, excellent. But I want to have time for Q&A, so maybe even though I'm talking quickly, I'll try and go a little bit faster. Um, to testing and continuous integration. Um, so smells, again, back to the code smells. Smells you aren't testing. If when you were thinking about that refactoring, and I was talking in the last section, you were thinking, yeah, but I'm worried I might break something. I, I won't do that change yet. Um, another smell might be you've got really, really long methods. Um, another thing might be, I know a bunch of you put your hands up for this in the first slide, things which used to work suddenly stop working and you thought you fixed that. Um, or you spend a lot of time in your notebooks or in your code trying things out manually. Um, another smell might be, when you first start a project, it goes really quickly and you feel you're on a roll. But as you add extra things, you seem to get slower and slower and slower and you deliver less and less, which is quite demoralizing. Um, and another sign might be you're scared to give demos or scared to modify other people's code. If any of these apply to you, they might be signs that you're not testing enough. Um, people imagine tests make you slow, but tests are like a safety net. Um, imagine yourself in situation, would you cross the higher plank first or the lower plank first? Um, you could run across that bottom plank because you're not going to fall very far onto the grass. The higher one, you're probably going to go very, very slowly, even with a safety wire. Your tests are your safety net when you're code. You just don't have to worry when you're coding because or making changes or modifying or refactoring because you're not gonna break anything because your tests will let you know instantly if you do. Um, and you have, you have to try the code anyway, right? You're gonna run it once. Why not run it in a testing framework? Um, because then you can then run it over and over again. So for those of you who don't know what I mean by a unit test, I guess most of you will, but some of you won't. Um, this is a Python unit test. Um, uh, Here's a thing which is testing the two upper method and you just stick in something and say assert equal that foo when you do two upper comes up as foo in uppercase. And this test is upper that is uppercase works, that this is upper, but this one with one uppercase letter one lowercase. This is what I mean by unit testing. Um, it's a, uh, so it's, it's, it can be that simple. And notice we're just testing one. A unit test is always testing a small bit of code. Um, another thing I love about tests is they encourage you to write nicer code because testing really big, long methods is hard. But so this writing tests encourages you to write small methods. Um, oh, by the way, when I say methods in some languages, they're called functions. It depends on your programming language, but they're I mean exactly the same thing. If you use Python, then whenever I say method, thinks function and you'll be right. Um, testing methods where you need to have lots of input or output can be hard. And so by writing testing, you encourages you to simplify your methods with fewer inputs or fewer outputs to your functions, which again, makes it easier to read. Um, usually you only wanna test one thing at once. 
So it encourages you to write methods that only do one thing. So that helps us with the previous thing of readability because um, our testing is making us write more readable code. They reinforce each other. And also your test reused the method. So it also makes your code probably reusable. Um, so yeah, testing is great. Um, there's unit testing frameworks for every programming language other than the sun. Python, there's ones called unit test, nose, pytest. I'm not going to tell you which is best. Pick a common one with the rest of your team and just use it. I'm not an expert in Python, and I'm even less of an expert in R, but I, a quick Google showed me that there's a test that package. You can even write unit tests for Excel or Google Sheets um, if you need to. And it's um, going to be critical for, again, for this wrap in the NHS, these reusable analytical pipelines, unit tests to make sure your code works before you distribute it and it does what you think. So, yeah, learn. So let's move on to continuous integration. Um, continuous integration is, a, once you have tests, is taking it to the next level. It basically means running all your tests all the time. That's all it means. It's a buzzword for that. Before, every time the code changes, someone commits to GitHub or to Git, some, an, a system checks out the code, runs all the tests, and is green. In the early days when it was a new thing, people loved it so much. I know you can create, people would create lava lamps, like a red one and a green one connected to a USB port in their computer. And when the tests had broken in check-in, they change it so the green lava lamp turned off and the red lava lamp turned on above their desk. And then when the tests were fixed again in green, the idea is you keep that green lava lamp on all the time. You can start with something simple manually. You can start with, this is what I did with our geospatial project. I just added a script you could run, which ran all the tests and say to everyone, hey, just run this script before you check in. Um, but even better is to have a server that you have running. Um, you can do it using GitHub Actions, which you get a certain amount of free quota for, or you can have your own server. Um, I know some of you will be working in restricted environments where it's hard to set up, um, but I think it's such a critical part of working that I would say to your managers or your leaders, look, in the same way you wouldn't want me to do my job without having Python, um, I just couldn't do it. This is a critical tool for getting my job done quickly. Um, give me some way, you know, it, you either give me the budget for GitHub if that's needed, but I know budget, I we worked in the civil service briefly, I know budget can be hard, or give me an old machine, or let me run it on my old machine, but find some way of having continuous integration. We also have this phrase at Google called the Beyonce rule, um, which I love. It's, if you liked it, you should have put a test on it. Um, it's basically, if you, uh, um, from, that's from all the single ladies, isn't it? Um, if you, uh, it's if someone breaks your code and you hadn't written a unit test for your code, you can't complain because you didn't test it. You didn't learn, you know, one know it was important to continue working. But if you put a test on your code and someone breaks it, then it's their fault. Um, cool. Yeah, um, Anthony's absolutely right. Jenkins, all the code for these continuous integrations is absolutely free for continuous integration. It's open source. So, yeah, find somewhere to put continuous integration on. Um, cool. So we're on to section four. And I think this goes for any profession, and you probably know it already, but it's worth reiterating, which is know your tools and libraries. Um, like when I do DIY at the weekend and I use a drill, um, I'm probably not using it right. And a professional carpenter would shudder. And that's kind of OK, because I'm not a professional. But once you become a professional in these spaces and you're getting paid to do a job, you should really learn to use your tools properly. Um, so the smells, you're maybe not using the tool, you're not confident using your tools. One might be you're spending more time using the mouse than the keyboard. Um, another smell might be you see other people getting more written than you every day. Um, another sign might be every time you use a particular tool like Git or Pandas or whatever it is, you get this little fear in your stomach that you don't quite know what you're doing, like I might do if I tried to use a bandsaw. Um, just this slight feeling the power tool's too much for you. There's, there are smells that um, you're not confident in your tools, and it's worth addressing those head on. So um, this book, um, Programming Pearl, I've got a copy here, um, is uh, was written again back in the 90s, in 91, I think. And he had this side quote in it. It wasn't the main 
point of the book, but there's, he said there's three virtues of a programmer, which are laziness, impatience, and hubris, which would normally not be virtues, they'd be vices. But uh, the point he was making was because as programmers, because we're lazy, we, we don't wanna do anything by our, or for ourselves. We want the computer to do it for us. So we write tools. So instead of trying out our code manually, we get a unit test server to test for us. Um, and so laziness is good. Similarly, impatience is good as a programmer because you don't want to spend hours clicking through something to try it out every time or rerunning your pipeline over and over again and manually looking at the results. Get the unit test to do it for you. So impatience is good. Um, and because we've got this laziness and impatience, we write really good tools. But if we don't use the tools, they don't give us the benefit. So be lazy and use the tools you've got. Um, so here are the investments I'd recommend that would pay off. Um, in the same way back in the medieval period, a stonemason would start as an apprentice and then go on to a journeyman and become a master craftsman. If you don't know how to use your tools, you're still in that sort of apprentice space and spend the time to do it. So use an, integra oops, use an integrated development environment, whether it's PyCharm, whether it's IntelliJ, you know, IntelliJ family, whether it's VS Code, whether it's RStudio, don't just be using a text editor. Um, this second one is do as I say, not as I do. I'm embarrassed to say I don't touch type properly. Um, I'm and I every so often I put the effort in to get a little bit better in it, but I still don't use every finger. I still, for comfort, look at the keyboard. Um, the US are miles ahead of us in the UK on this. Most of them learn to touch type in grade school or high school. In the UK, I think we often don't, but maybe things have got better since I was in school. Um, you will spend a lot of the rest of your career sitting in front of a keyboard. You know, an hour a day for a month will save you a lot more than 30 hours in the long term. And if you're younger than me, or even if you're my age, put the time in to do it. It will so pay off. Learn the keyboard shortcut in your favorite editor. Um, let me tell you a story about that. Um, I had a uh, colleague called Mike who told me about a time when he was pair programming with a more experienced developer. And all this experienced pro programmer did was every time he reached away for the keyboard for the mouse, the other developer picked up a ruler and started swiping at his hand. Now, I'm not recommended uh, recommending physical abuse at work. Don't do that. That's bad. But the, the lesson he was getting across was that you can do most things with a keyboard um, and it will save you a lot of time. Um, there's even a plugin for IntelliJ and PyCharm family called um, Key Promoter X that whenever you use the mouse, it'll put up a little notification go, did you know you could have done that with, you know, control shift M or whatever. So you learn them and it will tell you also the stats for the most common things you do that you could have used a keyboard shortcut. So um, yeah, learn how to use your source code control, learn how to use the testing framework and how to use all the helper things like the assert commands. Whatever library you use, learn how to use it idiomatically. And um, let me explain what I mean by idiomatically. Um, so I don't know how many people on the code are um, native English speakers, um, but in, for those who are, or hopefully this illustration will work for those who aren't, you, you can say, how are you today? Or, you, or how are things going today? Or you could say, how are you feeling today? I'm like, if I went to Mary and said, how are you doing? she'd just think it was a social greeting. If I said, how are you feeling today? She might think it's a bit of a start of a deep and meaningful conversation. Even though the two things mean roughly the same thing and they're kind of both correct, to an experienced speaker of the language, they actually mean very different things. The same is true in code. So in, if you take these two bit of pandas code, I don't know how many of you use pandas. Um, the first bit, does a data frame apply? And it's sort of natural and idiomatic to someone who uses pandas. It's telling something, I'm not doing something complicated. I'm just applying something over these two columns to get a third column or to get a data series in this case. This second quote is actually from our project again, and it's a for loop to, to produce a data frame. Now they both work, they'll both produce the thing. Um, I don't know which is faster and I shouldn't, you know, the, the idiomatic way might be faster, but it might not. But 
the moment an experience programmer looks at this, they're going to think, oh, they're doing a for loop. Why aren't they using a vectorized thing? Is something more complicated going on? Which columns are going, being used? Are they combining? How does it, you know, suddenly all sorts of questions come up in the reader. Whereas if you write it the idiomatic, the more natural way, in the same way Mary would say, when, how are you doing? She'd know I was just doing a greeting. In the, the first example, you know, this is just a simple create one column from two other columns. Whereas if you have the for loop, it just takes that little bit longer to read. So I don't know what your tools are. Some of you might be R and I basically know no R, but there will be idiomatic ways of doing things in your language. Learn what they are. If you don't know how to learn what they are, go on GitHub, look at common well-written libraries and see how they do things. Look at how things are used in tutorials. Um, when there's more than one way to do it, try and be consistent. Um, it'll help everyone read it. Aha, a good quote from Faizan. He said, uh, here is confident presentation, effective pandas. So yeah, that's exactly the sort of thing we should be using. We should be sharing in the PyCom community. Um, so that we can be consistent in all this sort of stuff. So how am I doing for time? 15 minutes, great. So I'll just do some stuff very quickly and then we'll get on to Q&A. So maybe start thinking, I don't see any questions in the chat yet. Start thinking about what your questions might be um, and then unmute or just put comments. So a bit of further reading. Um, the, this book is published by O'Reilly, but it's a, available completely free online at this resource. Um, they got a bunch of some of the most amazing programmers, software engineers at Google to write this book called Software Engineering at Google. And they just shared all these lessons about all sorts of areas. Um, it's, um, it's a good book. I'd really recommend it. It's more on software engineering than data science, but there's probably things you could think about. How can I use this um, in, you know, in my work? So free you might want to take some time looking at this. Um, if you've got any recommendations, I see people adding them to the chat already. Do add your own recommendations. Um, thank you so much. We're going to move on to questions in a second. My work email address is here. Please send me work-related stuff only, but if you're interested in um, collaborating on anything, yeah, do feel free to get in touch. Um, n 4 at google.com. Um, and Thank you very much. Mary, I will mute and hand back to you for now. Nick, thank you so much. That was really excellent. Um, please show your love in the chat or in your Microsoft team emojis. So thank you so, so much. You get claps and hearts. So yeah, this is yeah such a great talk. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, one question in the Q&A. So this is from Simon. He asks, any advice for writing un unit tests without access to the command line? I've used PyTest in the past, but sometimes in the NHS, people are scared to give you command line access. Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, so presumably you are writing Python, and if you are writing Python, you can run Python code. And so, I think I've never done this, um, but I would probably Googling Google something like Jupyter test notebooks. Um, you can write PyTest straight into a Jupyter notebook, straight into a Colab notebook. Um, I'm sure that would that would be one way of working it, and you wouldn't have to do a command line. Um, it wouldn't help with compute continuous integration. Um, you could possibly get someone who who's confident in the command line to write you something which took those Py some Colab notebooks and automatically ran them in a continuous integration service. Um, that's something I think about doing. Um, I've never done any of those things because generally, the other thing is, I guess if people are checking Python code into GitHub, um, you, again, you can do continuous integration and people don't need to touch the command line. The continuous integration does it. Um, yeah, those are just some ideas off the top of my head. I don't know if that answers Simon or whether you want to come back, feel free to unmute and do a follow up. I know that really helps. Thank you. <laughs> Simon, whilst you're on the line, do you want to ask your second question? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, sorry, let me just see actually what it said. Um, so, OK, in terms of readability and refactoring have you got any advice for kind of how big is too big for a method or function 
are there any like questions you would ask yourself um anything that you would kind of use to prompt you that maybe you need to refactor something out into multiple functions say if one was getting kind of too big yeah that's a great question um i'll start before i say any of my answers i'll start by saying these are all rules of thumb not rules so any if everything i say is not an absolute you must um internally i'd mostly do java at work internally we have some guidelines like if you start getting more than 50 lines um, it might be getting too big. Um, we also have the, what is the typical screen size for the people who are working on the project with you? And if it, if the function takes more than one screen size, um, more than one screen to see it all, it's probably too big because you want to be able to keep the function in your code. Um, another good example would be that, um, that seven plus or minus two rule I talked about. If you get to the point where you think, there's more than seven free variables, if you like variables floating on in the function, or um, there's more than, like every for loop gives you an extra level of indentation typically, and that's an extra sort of um, thing you have to keep in your free memory in your head. So I'd subtract that from the seven plus or minus two. So too many levels of indentation are a sign you might need to do it. Um, so those are all the sort of smells I'd use when I'm doing a code review. Um, of is this getting too long? Um, you sometimes get people going too extreme the other way. They pull everything down to one line functions and they think now my code is really readable. The trouble with that is you end up with a lot of functions named almost exactly the same thing. And you might, your working memory, your seven plus or minus two is taken up by, you've gone down a tree of nine different functions to get to where you are and you're trying to keep the whole stack in your head. And that's difficult. So there is, like many things, there's a trade-off in this space, but hopefully those are useful things to think about. Definitely. Yeah, thank you. I think I'm guilty of the of the second one sometimes. <laughs> Cheers though. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Simon, for your question. Quite a few people are asking about, I think this program you said that monitors your mouse movements and tells you which shortcuts to use instead. Oh yeah, let me go back to my notes and um, find the. I've got the link in my speaker notes, so I will put it in the uh, chat. Um, it's um, it's a plugin for in. Uh, I've now lost my tab. Too many Google tabs open. Um, uh, there you go. It's in the chat. It's a plugin for the IntelliJ family, which use Python. Um, oh, Daniel Schofield beat me to it. Um, that's the right one. Um, uh, yeah, and it's um. Yeah, it, it, I don't know if other plugins are available for other libraries, but I would expect they are. Great, thank you. Um, another question from Dan, a different Dan. Um, he wants to know more about your setup, I think at home, uh, if you use vertical dual monitors and things like that. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a, there's lots of ways of doing it. I don't think there's a right way of doing it, but as you can see, I have my bookcases behind me. Um, and my globe behind me to keep my world focused. Um, but then in front of me, I have a laptop and then set up on a high enough stand, I have a big 4K monitor um, above my laptop and I join the two together and I find the 4K monitor then lets, puts me, lets me pour, I don't know how many inches it is. It's, uh, I bought it during the pandemic, but it's probably 32 inch or something. It's pretty big and it gives me um, a lot of space for moving things around. Um, I find that works way well for me. I know a lot of people put their laptop in the dock. Um, the trouble with my setup is you have to use a laptop keyboard, which isn't the best keyboard, and I don't touch type, but people who are fussy about their touch typing keyboard will often do it. When I worked in the bank, I had two document mode side-by-side -side monitors and a proper keyboard. That worked well for me, but um, yeah, there's not a right answer. That's what I use. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, so Alwyn has asked, can you tell us a bit more regarding what you do in population health at Google? So um, I'll be somewhat circumspect about it. Um, it's a really pretty new area for Google. So we're definitely looking for collaborations and looking for ideas. Um, I'd, my general take on it would be that 
both worldwide and in the NHS in particular. We've been largely um, demand led. We've dealt with the patients that have turned up in front of us rather than need led, um, as in where can you get the most bang for the buck or whatever. Um, to be need led, you have to have data and you need a lot of data and then you need to process this and get insights from it. Um, Google's quite good at getting data, processing it, combining it and doing those sorts of things. It also is true that the NHS doesn't have the best record when it comes to IT and computing projects. So if there's areas where we can write more general tools that then people in the NHS can use for their specific needs to do analysis as we move into this more integrated care system, population health mode, um, they're the sort of things we want to want to look at and want to help. Um, but we're still pretty early on um, in this space. Um, so yeah, uh, they're the sort of thing, I don't know if that's specific enough, um, but yeah. Okay, I will just have some time for maybe two, two more questions. I actually wanted to ask if there were any cultural differences you noticed between uh, Google, I suppose, their engineering team and data science team that you saw in the NHS. Oh, um, I guess one cultural difference um, differences in resourcing, which you're always going to get for government versus commercial, but especially Google. Um, historically at Google, the engineers were kind of king. We have all these data centers and more computing power, loads of this stuff. Um, I know as data science in the NHS, you're often fighting your access to servers or laptops or whatever. I guess another thing is the constraints from the IT department, because in the NHS is quite rightly very protective of data leaks and privacy of data. Um, often you're very restricted into what you can install and so forth. Um, Google, actually, we have to be very protective and very security conscious. You know, everyone in the world is trying to hack Google to get access on our data. So we have to be very careful with security. But I still think we probably have we have amazingly good security teams who give us the freedom to do our jobs and use the software we need to use um, without getting slowed down too much. So I think we're very lucky in that respect. They're not really cultural things, but I guess they're differences. Um, I think a big, huge advantage you have over us is you hopefully have those day-to-day -day access with real clinicians or even patients on the ground, which because this NHS, the NHS kind of has a halo around it of if you're inside the NHS bubble, then you're a goodie. And if you're like me at Google and at a commercial organization, then you're probably a baddie just trying to make lots of money for an American corporation. Um, mm -hmm. It can be sometimes hard to do helpful things because um, you're outside the halo. So I think that's something I've seen, which I think you find things easier than us, which is why I've absolutely loved being able to work with Paul and Ollie and Mary and so forth. And that I've been able to bring some of the expertise and they've been able to bring some of the benefits of being within the halo without sh quick slay. They've not shared any data with me or anything like that. We've all been working on open source stuff, but um, they've been able to share the real problems people are having. And that's a real privilege. Um, did that answer the question? Yeah, it definitely did. Um, we're running to time, so I just wanted to thank you again, Nick, for your time and your brilliant presentation. I've got a feedback form in the chat, so it'd be really great if people could fill that in so we can plan for future events. And yeah, feel free to email Nick if you have further questions or me as well. But thank you so much, everyone, for your for coming, your attention. And yeah, hope you have a very good day. Cool. Thank you for coming. Thank you, everyone.